Sandinistas from all across Nicaragua are pouring into Managua for a mass celebration on the 40th anniversary of the victory of the Sandinista Revolution. Health workers in Rwanda have started a mass vaccination campaign against the Ebola virus. And the Iranian Revolutionary Guard says it stopped a British oil tanker in the Strait of Hormuz and guided it to a port in Iran. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South, and I'm Camila Escalante. All is ready at the Plaza La Fe to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Sandinista Popular Revolution, an event that marked the end of the Somoza dictatorship. These are live images as Sandinistas from all around the country have poured into the capital by caravan, having set out last night and in the early morning. A massive celebration is set to take place at the plaza, and the central act will begin at 4 p.m. local time presided over by President Daniel Ortega. Nicaraguans are not only commemorating the historic occasion, this year is of particular significance as the country defeated the latest attempt at foreign intervention in 2018. It's been 40 years and the victorious people of Nicaragua, the victorious people of León are entering Managua to commemorate this extraordinary deed of transformation in Nicaragua. The popular Sandinista revolution was an extraordinary feat which came and transformed the situation in Latin America and in the world, and today we're commemorating, celebrating with Comandante Daniel, with Compañera Rosario, with the people of León, the first capital of the revolution. We're mobilizing victorious, joyful, and full of energy, along with Comandante Daniel. We'll continue building peace, we'll continue building hope, a future with prosperity and a well-being of the Nicaraguan people. Let's take a look at the top achievements of this social, historical and political process in Nicaragua. Young students awaited their turn to present the theater play Milestones and History of the Revolution. It explains how the Sandinista Front has evolved since revolutionary leader Augusto Cesar Sandino left an ideological mark on his country. One of the students, Sergio, explains that while he's young, he's a true admirer of the general of the free people. I believe Sandino is the foremost figure of the ideological fight of the Sandinista Front, because his revolutionary sense, not only within his mind, but he also stands against those who come from abroad to try to influence our government policies, in our internal policies and how we manage our system. Analyst Adolfo Pastran says the important social advancement achieved by the FSLN should be promoted from the program to provide houses, to fixing the streets, to even the incorporation of the Caribbean into the Pacific after 200 years of isolation. After everything that happened last year, the violent protests, the attempted coup, I think us Nicaraguans are more conscious First, regarding who is telling the truth and who is lying, then who is working for the poor and who isn't. And last, the Sandinistas have to defend this project. The Sandinista party is more consolidated than last year, and their bases are more determined under one leadership. On the other hand, I see the opposition with few leaders, no visible head, several parties, no leader, no vision no proposal for a nation. The legendary commander Doris Tijerino, a historic guerrilla fighter, first woman to lead the police forces, and a current legislative member, promoted the achievements of the Sandinista revolution in its two phases, and said that beyond health and free education is the situation of women among other 40 social programs, which is more important. Something I'm passionate about is that everything relates to the topic of women, beginning with the need to treat women with respect as the government promoted since 1979, when they forbade the use of the image of a woman for propaganda. 
And today we have equality, and by law we have the right to occupy 50% of public offices. Also from 2007 until 2019, there have been 7,569 electricity projects, providing almost 600,000 households with energy for 3.12 million people. Only in the last five years, a thousand water systems were built. Six sewage projects in different cities that have transformed the lives of 33,600 families were built as well. Members of Brazil's landless workers movement, Marielle Vive Camp, held a funeral overnight for murdered community member Luis Ferreira da Costa, who was hit by a truck while demonstrating for the right for the community's water access. One person was arrested late Thursday by the civilian police, having confessed to the crime, which injured several others. The organization is demanding an end to the targeted violence against rural workers and social movements. About 1,000 families live in the Marielle Vive camp, which was occupied by the Agrarian Reform Movement in April 2018, named in honor of slain Rio de Janeiro Councilwoman Marielle Franco. Now, more than ever, we must show our strength in unity, comrades. We must show all the authorities that here are people, a people with dignity and who fight, and we will not lower our heads. It was 8 in the morning in Valinos, and a thousand families from the Mariel camp of the Landless Workers Movement were handing out food and protesting. They've been occupying this idle land for a year. Suddenly, a pickup truck raced along the road towards them. Apparently, the driver was armed. He ran over 10 of the activists, including a 72-year-old bricklayer, Luis Ferreira. He bled to death as he arrived at the hospital. He has spent his whole life working, struggling and suffering for this country. And with so many kids around, a coward comes and does this. We are very sad. This has hit us really hard. The members of the MST had been demonstrating to demand their water supply be turned back on. It had been cut off by the mayor of Valencia, a region where agribusiness and gated communities consume large amounts of water. It's an hour and a half from Sao Paulo, the richest city in South America. Every day, Uriel spends an hour fetching water for his home. It's very difficult. When we had water, it was easier. They cut it off and everything got a lot worse. You can't live without water. Amid all the grief, the landless movement pointed to the federal government's responsibility in this crime, and they want justice from the local authorities. What happened here has a direct link to the political situation in Brazil today. President Jair Bolsonaro and the governor of Sao Paulo, Jao Doria, are responsible for this climate of hate. They have encouraged Brazilians to attack the social movements. The police have arrested a suspect who has confessed to the crime. The movement has called a protest in the region to protest against the wave of violence in the countryside. International delegations have arrived in Caracas, Venezuela, ahead of the ministerial meeting of the Coordinating Bureau of the Non-Aligned Movement set for the weekend. A number of preparatory meetings have already taken place in which representatives discussed issues such as the decolonization of Puerto Rico and Palestine, the tightening of the economic blockade against Cuba, and Venezuela's resistance against imperialist attacks. Venezuela's Minister of Communication Jorge Rodriguez also announced that before the end of this ministerial meeting, a number of agreements will be established to be approved during the upcoming Heads of State meeting in October. The health workers' strike in Peru has entered its third day, as a heavy police presence has been deployed outside of the health ministry. Our correspondent in Lima, Jaime Herrera, has the latest. As we can see, the health ministry is being guarded by police in riot gear. As the striking health workers have gathered just across the street, this is the third day of their indefinite strike. The workers say they have yet to receive any response from the health minister about starting a dialogue table in order to discuss their demands, which include 
a budget increase for hospitals as well as salary increases for all health workers. We'll take a short break now. Join us again in a few. Welcome back. Trinidad and Tobago's government says that there will be an expansive audit to determine whether multi-million dollar contracts have been given to gang leaders. The Minister of Rural Development and Local Government, Kazim Hossein, says that he intends to address the allegations as a matter of urgency. This follows an investigative piece into a confidential police report which named seven reputed gang leaders who benefited sure. from contracts from two order, order state order corporations. This report was published two days after the police commissioner said that the practice had fueled gang wars and contributed to the rise in homicides for 15 years. Members complete admitted. Authorities in Haiti in cooperation with the United Nations mission for the support of peace and justice have destroyed hundreds of guns which were seized from colonels. The weapons were destroyed at the event that took place at the National Police Academy in the capital of Port-au-Prince. Obsolete police arms were also destroyed at the same event. The exercise is part of efforts to reduce gang violence and drug trafficking. The PNH had initiated the process of destruction of obsolete arms in the institution. In addition to those seized during operations, today under your watchful eyes we will destroy some in front of you. It is very little, but it is significant. Guyana's very first oil production vessel is expected to arrive in the country in September. The Lisa Destiny departed Singapore on Thursday. It is owned by multinational oil and gas corporation ExxonMobil. The vessel has the production capacity of 120,000 barrels of oil per day and an average storage volume of 1.6 million. With the development of oil, Guyana is set to be the fastest growing economy in the world with its GDP increasing from U.S. $3.1 billion in 2016 to $13 billion in 2025. The Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association is calling a discussion by a decision by Booking.com to charge hotels commission commissions on resort fees on top of hotels rate, base rate as grossly unfair. The trade organization wrote a letter to Booking.com citing a strong negative backlash from members, particularly on how the police cuts into employee the policy cuts into employee tips and gratuities. The CHTA pointed to a recent survey of its 33 hotel and tourism federation associations, which states that the commission's policy is regressive and punitive, adding to Booking.com's revenue, which, while reducing the profitability of the Caribbean tourism industry. Opposition parties in the Dominican Republic have taken to the streets to oppose the re-election of President Danilo Medina, who's hoping to lead the country for a third term. The surroundings of the National Congress once again became a stage for large demonstrations, this time against a constitutional reform that would allow President Danilo Medina to run for third term. We must comply with the Constitution. The President knows that the Constitution denies a third term in office, and he must comply with the oath he took in 2015, so that the Dominican people can live in peace. The Constitutionalist Military Foundation was also present to stand against the constitutional reform. In the Dominican Republic, the government has to determine whether they want us to keep living in a social and democratic state, or if they want to bring a dictatorship back. Therefore, we ought to be responsible and respect our constitution. Demonstrations outside Congress show no sign of slowing down. Former President Dr. Linel Fernandez also came out to protest with a number of lawmakers and supporters. It's time for us to rescue the Dominican Republic, to establish a decent government that promotes ethics, morals, and basic values, so we all can live in equality and have the same opportunities. As dusk came, dozens of citizens held a candle at the Independence Plaza under the slogans, we don't want re-elections and no more abuses of our constitution. Fears rose in Rwanda after reports that a suspected Ebola patient had crossed from Goma City in the DRC to Rwanda before she died. 
However, the World Health Organization has ruled out the case, the Ebola case, saying that the 22-year-old woman could not have slipped into the country without being spotted. The news comes as health workers in Rwanda have started a massive prevention and vaccination campaign against Ebola on key routes and border areas. 1,700 people have died in the DRC since the Ebola epidemic began last August. I'm just happy that people are starting to cooperate. The communications department is there to make people understand just how serious the disease is. Of course, there is fear. You know that Ebola is a very serious disease and an epidemic that kills many people. So, one must be very careful and follow the instructions given by the WHO. Meanwhile, the African Union has warned against curbing travel to the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo despite the Ebola outbreak. During a press conference, an AU health specialist said that thousands who cross from the DRC to Uganda on market days are being screened. The WHO this week declared the outbreak a public health emergency of international concern, a rare designation only used for the gravest ap ap epidemics. The threat is high. Uh, as we speak, there is no Ebola disease outbreak in Uganda, but the mass movement of people suggests that it can happen anytime. Uh, what we need to do is to intensify that uh, scenario I just described earlier, which is to make sure that the, the two governments are, are speaking to each other. We want to be sure that the international community and member states in Africa do not impose any restrictions on travels to anyone going into or coming outside of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Former South African President Jacob Zuma has said he will no longer take part in an inquiry into state corruption. After five days of hearings, the Deputy Justice Minister has adjourned the public inquiry, while efforts are made to persuade Zuma to return to provide evidence. The former president has been accused of using his office to develop an elaborate web of corruption, much of it centered on his friends in the Gupta family. Earlier, his lawyer said that Zuma's withdrawal was not a sign of disrespect. My client has instructed me that he will take no further part in these proceedings. He respected you, he still does, he respects this commission, but the com commission does not seem to know its ground rules. At the same time, South Africa's anti-corruption watchdog has accused the current president, Cyril Ramaphosa, of deliberately misleading parliament. It says he violated the con constitution and breached the executive ethics code when he failed to tell parliament last November about a $36,000 contribution to his campaign to lead the African National Congress. From Cobra Formation, Land grabbing, the reduction of communal pastures, and the increasingly severe impact of climate change are triggering more and more severe intercommunity conflict in Kenya's Rift Valley. This is the Pokot ethnic group. They spend most of the day in the shade next to a road that hardly anyone uses. They say they no longer have any cows but goats, which they have to take very far to graze. The goats, the cows, they're all dead. Cattle thieves are gradually bringing insecurity to the east of the lake, and people have been blaming the Pokots for this crime for more than 10 years. But they say the bandits come from the north, and they don't know who they are, although they recognize that there is a land conflict. Even in the city, there are thieves and bandits. Although they might be few in number, they need to return to their own communities. The girls, who don't speak Swahili because they haven't gone to school, are trying to earn money by burning coal, but they don't reveal anything. The only thing the girl says is that you shouldn't bother them because they're hungry. We don't have seeds to plant crops. People want the government to at least provide seeds because we cannot afford to buy them. People here simply don't have the money. We don't even have the manpower to plant herbs and take care of the pastures. 
There's a tourist hub owned by a Mzungo businessman on one of the islands and a five-star hotel on another where you can pay up to $400 a night to admire an ecosystem full of crocodiles, hippos, eagles and many different species of birds. And this other island is home to an ambitious conservation plan led by a U.S. government-funded organization. They've introduced seven giraffes and some ostriches on the island so far, but there are also plans to bring some lions. But the future of these islands is uncertain as there is armed conflict on the other side of the border. People of the Ilkamas ethnicity who once founded Mukutanim village are now just sitting on the rocks displaced from their homes. We came from the other side of the island. We had to flee because of cattle theft and conflicts. They want pastures only for themselves. That's the main reason. The main reason. The tourism management ignores the community's talents, and here they can't cultivate the land or take care of cows, so they practically have nothing to do. Since we're on this side, we stay at home with nothing to do. We have no orchards, and we don't have cows to breed. The elders want to return to Mukutanim village, but there are safety concerns. Their main challenge is to send the younger generation to school. Tourist companies and conservation organizations have been promising to launch scholarships, but they rarely keep their word. We pray to God to at least get a conservation model that is very serious and co-productive. From the Baringo Lake, Oscar Apelde, Telesur. Let's go back to Managua, Nicaragua, where massive crowds of Sandinistas are gathered at the Central Plaza La Fe, rallying ahead of the main commemorative act set for 5 p.m. local time to be led by President Daniel Ortega and other leaders of the FSLN government. Caravans of militants, Sandinista militants, have poured in from across the country for this and other celebratory events. We'll be right back after this break. Don't go away. Welcome back. Iran's Revolutionary Guard says it has stopped a British oil tanker in the Strait of Hormuz and guided it to a port in Iran. The Stena Impera was heading, headed to Saudi Arabia with 23 crew on board. The Iranian Port and Maritime Organization told local media that it had detected problems with the tanker and asked the military to guide it to Bandar Abbas port for investigations. The British government's COBRA Emergency Committee has been meeting to discuss the situation. The statement released by Islamic Revolution of God Corps Navy Public Relations reads, On Friday, July 19th, in the evening, a British oil tanker called Center Empire was stopped by a vessel of God's First Division while passing through the Strait of Hormuz because of failing to observe international maritime regulations at the request of the Ports and Aviation Authority of Hormongan Province. Still in Iran, authorities have denied that a U.S. warship shot down one of its drones in the Strait of Hormuz. Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps released footage in which it shows a U.S. drone monitoring the USS Boxer through the Strait. President Trump had announced on Thursday that the craft was destroyed, but Iran's deputy foreign minister said that the U.S. might have shot down its own drone by mistake. According to Iran state media, the armed forces said that all such aircrafts had returned safely to their bases. On Thursday, an Italian court overturned all charges against German Captain Carola Raquette, who was accused of aiding illegal immigration. Raquette, who captained the migrant rescue ship Sea Watch 3 with over 40 migrants on board, was detained after refusing to comply with a ban on entering Italy's ter territorial waters. We were joined earlier by Sea Watch spokesperson Shadi Sadiq, who talked about the need for rescue missions to continue on the Mediterranean Sea without being criminalized. This EU policy uh, of 
criminalizing the rescuer. Uh, and so we don't expect this to tone down uh, and we don't, you know, the, the recent standoff of us being um, in front of Lampedusa for 17 days waiting for Italy to take its responsibility, that is the new trend which uh, is being spearheaded by Minister Salvini, whose slogan is the ports are closed. Um, we don't think that this intimidation or criminalization uh, uh, should be enough to shut us down and we will continue to find ways to um, continue our rescue operation because the humanitarian incentive and the emergency still persists in the Mediterranean and we urge that the European Union, including the Italian government uh, as a member state and as a coastal state, take up their legal obligation to coordinate rescues and ensure that they end in people reaching a port of safety, which is definitely not Libya. We've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at tellusterenglish.net. And right before we leave, we head back to Managua, the capital of Nicaragua, where thousands are gathered in the Plaza La Fe, awaiting the start of the commemorative act led by President Daniel Ortega celebrating the 40th anniversary of the triumph of the Sandinista Revolution.